All right, so Numbers 4. There's a lot to get into this morning, so let's just start out by reading just a few, few uh, verses together, uh, just the very first four verses, and then we'll jump straight into a lot. Okay, so it says this in verse 1, Numbers 4, verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Moses. What's the Hebrew word for that? Anybody remember? Great. Way to beer. Okay, so it's, it's one of those things you see over and over. Uh, he spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, Take a census of the descendants of Kohath from among the sons of Levi, but their family, uh, by their families, by their father's households from 30 years and upward, even to 50 years old, all who enter the service to do the work in the tent of meeting. This is the work of the descendants of Korath in the tent of meeting concerning the most holy things. Now, just so you know, Numbers 4 is kind of an extension to Numbers 3. I told you last week there were some things that we didn't have time to get into in Numbers 3, but they're explained in further detail in Numbers 4. So I knew this day was coming, so we didn't get into it as much last week. But before we get into to, to a lot of the Numbers 4 stuff, let's review a couple things out of Numbers 3, just so that we're all on the same page. Some of you weren't here last week. I want to make sure we're on the same page here. So... Um, Remember we said priests were all from the tribe of Levi. Levi, but not all Levites are priests. So just to explain for some of those of you that might not have been here, that's, that's always kind of confused me. This is the line of Levi in, in the Old Testament. And you see that he has three sons. We'll talk about them some today. In one of the lines, you get the line of Aaron. From the descendants of Aaron come the priestly class, Okay. But you can be a Levite, you can be from a descendant of one of these other ones, and not be a priest, because you're not from Aaron, okay? So that's, that's one of those things that you have to kind of get it straight in your mind, or some of the things that we're going to talk about doesn't really make sense. So, so know that you can be a Levite and not a priest, but you, it's not the other way around, okay? Now, the other thing is... We talked about, the la really since the beginning of Numbers, this idea of how they camped, right? And you have the tabernacle in the middle. Um, here's where God is, right? Here's the altar. And then we talked about how around it you have the 12 tribes. Who, who camps right here? Okay. Right here is the, the entrance. The priest camp right here. Right, the priest camp to the east, guarding the entrance. You have the Gershonites over here, sons of Gershon, one of Levi's sons. Okay, you have the the uh, Merarites up here, and then you have the Kohenites down here. Now the Kohenites are where Aaron's line comes from. I know this is a lot thrown at you in, in just a quick thing, but it's all going to come together. Okay, so just just picture in mind. Moses and Aaron are over here, and then you have three other family groups of Levites here that ha are going to have different responsibilities, which we're going to get into. Now, so that's kind of the setting, the stage of where we are as we get in to Numbers 4. Now, let's just imagine together, what was it that made them move from where they're camped here to somewhere else? Okay, God told them. Or... How, how did they know God told him? Did he just say, Moses, Aaron, pick up and go? No, you're right. They're, they're going by what by day and what by night. You got all the story coming together for you. They're moving as God moves. So let's say they wake up one morning and, oh, my goodness, there goes the cloud. Okay, it's time to move. Now, what happens? Okay, what's the first thing taken down? Let me just give you a, a just kind of give you a glimpse. They go from the most important things to the least important things. Okay, good. So the number one thing is the Ark of the Covenant sitting right here in the Holy of Holies, right? Okay, now we have a problem. Hmm. First off, what family group was to move the holiest of the items? Anybody know? Is it the Merarites, the Gershonites, or the Kohenites? The Kohenites. Okay, that's the same priestly class. Okay, so, so, okay. So, so the Kohenites' job is to move the ark, but we have a problem. Can they go into the Holy of Holies? No. Hmm. 
Any idea what they did? Okay, what if it's not Yom Kippur? We still have a problem. The, the high priest can go in, but it's one day a year. What if God doesn't move on Yom Kippur? Still have a problem. Okay. Well, let's, let's talk about what happens. In the Bible, there are three screens. Three it, screens. Screens, okay? That's what they're called in the Bible. The f screens, like a screen, like a TV screen, a screen. I, I, I know I've got a southern draw a little bit, but I think I'm saying screen right. I don't know. Uh, okay, sorry. Flat screens. Okay, where's the first screen as you kind of get to the tabernacle? Anybody know where the first? The entrance. Okay, so right here is the first screen. First screen is on the eastern side. Uh, where would the second one be? Great. Right here to get into the, actually the most holy, the, the holy place, not the holy place. So number two is actually to get into the holy place. Now where's the third one then? Okay. Now, did you know it's to get into the holy of holies, there's a third screen. The other two screens, every time you see in Scripture, okay, every time you see in Scripture, they're called the same Hebrew word, masak, M-A-S-A-K. Okay, you're like, I don't care, but it makes, it makes sense. Let me tell you. The only word, the only one that's called something different is this one right here. The third one. The third one. To go in the Holy of Holies is, is a completely, it, it actually is a masak, but there's another part to it. Uh, I want to spell it right. It's a per, it, perroquet, is how they say it, perroquet. Now, now, why does that even matter? This right here, probably so, because it means, and we'll, we'll get into that. Now, this right here is what covers the ark. If you're going to transport the ark, Aaron, his sons, they're the only, I mean, they're priests, so they can go into the holy place. If you're not a priest, you're a Levite, you can't go in there. You got to understand, this right here is more a part of the ark than it is the structure of the tabernacle. So a priest goes in, takes that screen, that veil, and it says in Numbers 3, Numbers 4, chapter, uh, verse 5, covers the ark. Okay? It is the covering, one of the coverings to transport it. Now, here is... Here is what happens, okay? How big is the holy is the holy of holies? You think it's pretty big, pretty small? Ten cubits by ten cubits. How long's a cubit? A cubit is from here to here, okay? So for me it's nineteen inches. But in the Bible, they round around eighteen inches is what they soak. So how long would how big would the holy of holies be? Can y'all do math? Fifteen feet by fifteen feet is ten cubits by ten cubits, so it's a, it's it's fifteen feet by fifteen feet. Now, okay, here's what happens. The holy of holies is be, what is behind the parquet. What happens as you move the screen? The holy of holies is always what's behind it. Okay, so Aaron and his sons can move the screen, and that's what they did. And you lay it over the ark. Now all of a sudden, guess what? Anybody can get in there because it's not the Holy of Holies. Any, the, the Holy of Holies is underneath the parroquet. So all of a sudden, the only Holy of Holies is the ark. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, so that's what they had to do to transport. The first thing is Aaron and his sons have to go in because they're the only ones that can go in there. They have to do that. So that's the very first thing. It's covered, by the way, in three coverings. The ark is. Why? What would happen if a Levite touched the ark? He's dead. They cover it, and the third covering is this purple-blue covering, so you could recognize it no matter where you are. Oh, there's the ark. You can see it. Okay, what's the second thing that they covered? If, I, if they go from the most important objects to the least important objects, what do you think the second thing they covered is? The ark of the covenant. 
purplish blue, uh, the apparel cap, that's what color it was. So you could see it coming. And that'll make more sense in just a minute. But just remember three coverings. What's the second, what's the second, and you can read in Numbers 4 there, what's the second thing they covered? They used animal skins. What was the next item they covered? The animal skins, by the way, was the protection. The table of the presence or the, or the table of showbread. Why would that be the second most important thing? What happened? That's the, that is where God's people fellowshiped, broke bread with the God of the universe. And God looks at it and he says, you know what? Yeah, my presence is right here, but the most important thing to me is where I fellowship with my people. It had three coverings. It is the only two objects that had three coverings. Every other one finished with that animal skin covering. There are two objects that you saw coming, and they're purplish blue when they're being carried. That's the two things that matter to God. It's kind of like if you're moving, and you're like, I need to make sure I can get to this thing quickly. I need to know which thing this is when I get to get there, because it's going in first or whatever. Well, that's kind of what he did with these are the, most two, the two most important objects, okay? Now, so you keep going. Menorah is number three. Well, that's not wrong. Yeah, the menorah is number three. But you can go down. So here's the thing. Basically, if you go down the list, the Kohenites, the priests go in and wrap up six big things that the Kohenites were to move. Okay, that's basically what happens. Okay, they, they wrap them up in, in usually two to three different layers, and that's what the Levites, the Kohenites, were to carry. Okay, now, I have no idea where I'm in my notes, but we'll keep going. The bronze altar. Can you imagine carrying that big old sucker? How many coverings? Three. Two. Everything but those first two things had two coverings. Okay? Everything. Now, how many men do you think it took to carry that? See, in Scripture, all it says is they put these rods on either side and you carried it. And our mind almost kind of goes to, oh, there must have been like four guys. No, there's probably like 40 guys. I mean, that thing had to be heavy, right? I mean, that, that thing had to be heavy. Exactly, exactly. But, but, but what happens now? So the Kohenites go in, you've got these six, sorry, the priests go in, they wrap these things up, what happens next? God's moving, I see the cloud going, what, what, what happens next? We've got to get going. Yeah, now it's time, though, for the Kohenites to come and get those big objects. Could they... Oh, I don't want to jump ahead of myself. Um, let, let me keep going because I'm. So here's what it says. Look at verse 15 with me. When Aaron and his sons have finished covering the holy objects, so the priests have gone in, they've covered everything, and all the furnishings of the sanctuary, when the camp is to set out, after that the sons of Kohath shall come to carry them, so they will not touch the holy objects and die. These are the things in the tent of meeting which the sons of Kohath are to carry. So if they touch it, they will die. And, and, and I just, I, I was thinking through this this week. I think God has some teachings in that for us too. There, there are things that God says, this is holy to me. Understand the weight of them, the importance of them. Don't come to them half-heartedly. Know their place because they matter to me, right? And, and, and I, just, I was just wondering, what are those things in my life that are absolutely holy to God. Like, he wants me treating respectfully. He wants me doing things his way in this thing. And, and, and again, that can look different for all of us, but if, if I'm a believer, if you're a believer, our antenna should go up as we see all these people are trying to do is get the tabernacle as God's leaving. And he says, if you don't handle it the right way, you're dead. I don't care if you're trying to do it. Understand my way and do it my way. And that carries some weight. I mean, I'm thinking if I'm a Kohenite and I'm growing up, I'm thinking I better get this right. Daddy, how are you carrying it? Because I just, I got to make sure I do it the same way because I, I know what happens if I don't do it right. And you feel the weight of, of saying, God, if this is holy to you, I want to do it the right way. And my question is, right now, each of us who have accepted Christ have the Holy Spirit living in us. And our job is to carry him wherever we go. Do we understand the weight of that? 
We don't do that half-heartedly. We don't do that just flippantly. Do we carry him? Are we intentional to do it right? And that was just something I wrestled with this week. Now, so imagine clouds moving. The uh, Kohenites have their holy object, their six big old packages that they get to carry around. Now, what else? What about these other two groups? What do they carry? Okay, the other stuff. So you have the Gershonites on the western side, and they're the ones who get the curtains and all that fun stuff. You have the Merarites on the north side, and they're the ones that get all the, the supporting structure, like all the beams and all the pegs and all the things that actually help make it into a tabernacle. Okay, They're the ones that, that carry all the support. Now, here's my question. Does any of them get to use carts or oxen? The answer is yes. Numbers chapter 7, God gives six carts and 12 oxen. But then he specifies there's only two of the groups that get to use them. Guess who had to carry the things on their shoulders? This group down here that had the holiest of objects, the, the Kohenites, could not use any cart or any oxen. These two had carts and oxen to put the pegs on, to put the curtains on. But, oh, God says this, this is too important for you to put on a cart. Now, where that comes into play, anybody know the story of Uzzah? What? It was falling off what? Should it have ever been on a cart? God's word specifically says the Kohenites are to carry all of my precious things, okay? It should have never been on that cart to begin with. So you see, knowing some of this stuff matters because then you get to another story, and you're like, oh man, dumb Uzzah, he shouldn't have, it should have never been, it wasn't his, it shouldn't have been on the cart to begin with. That was never God's intention. Now, let's get back to, to Numbers 4. Uh, by the way, that story is in 2 Samuel 6. If you want to look it up later, uh, you, can, you can remind yourself of that story. So um, let's get back to, to this, this lovely Numbers 4 story. Now, I think about it like this, and I may be completely off base. This is not biblical. This is Markology, I guess. But, but let me ask you a question. These were the priests. What if you're from the line of Levi, but you belong to one of these clans, do you, these, these families? Do you think you feel as appreciated as the priests? I mean, the priests are the ones that, oh man, when the spotlight comes on, they're the ones who offer that sacrifice. They're the ones who, who get to go in to the table of showbread and dine with the God of the universe. They're the ones... <laughs> That, that get to do all those things, and the people have to look at them and say, oh, man, that's a priest. Well, if you're a Levite, you're a mover. I mean, your job is to do all the hard work to get this from point A to point B, but you're not. Do you think they felt appreciated? I, I mean, I, I don't know. I'm just putting myself in the story, and you start thinking through it, and these guys do all the work. Yet it's those priestly family members that get all the credit. But, but let me ask you something. How many sermons have you heard about the Kohenites and the Merorites and the, and the Gershonites? How, how many sermons have you even heard of that? Ask Bert. I said, how many times have you preached on those, those families? He said, never. Now, how many times have you heard about the priests? A lot. Obviously, the priests were important, but I, what if these other families didn't show up for work? What if they didn't show up for work? What, what if the clouds move and they're like, guys, no, that's too much work. <laughs> Come on back, God. We, we, we're good here. The priests, one of two things has to happen. One, the tabernacle never gets moved if these guys don't do it. So I don't care if you have priests. But there's no tabernacle to go into. There's no holy place. There's no most holy place. There's no ark because those guys haven't moved it. So number one, one option is 
It's done. Or the second option is these priests do all the work. All of a sudden the priests say, okay, well, I guess if the Kohenites aren't going to carry the ark, I'll carry it. George, you go get the tabernacle. You, you know, they, they start carrying it themselves. Do you understand what would happen if the priests had to do all that? Could they do their job when they get to the next site? Do you understand why it says in the Bible, these family members were masharits to the priests, which means they do all of those menial tasks so that the priest can do their job when they get to the next site. And you may be in here thinking, you know what? I feel like what I've been asked to do in God's story, I feel like I'm not that appreciated. Or I feel like maybe I'm not in the spotlight. And I want you to know the Gershonites, the Merarites, the Koalites, they are important to the story. And without them, the story stops. I don't care where you are and what God's asked you to do. It doesn't matter if he hasn't called you to teach or to preach. God has a role for you. And you may not even know the fullness of what that looks like, but your job is to get up and do what God calls you to do. And if it's behind the scenes, that's great. Because serving is important too. And this whole worship thing can't happen without these other family members understanding their role in the story and not looking for the spotlight. And that's, it's okay, guys, if you're a Koalite. It's okay if you're a, 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 a Merarite, a Gershonite. It's okay to be that. That's what most of us are. It's okay. But our job is to faithfully get up day by day, say, God, where are you? And say, I'm being led by you, and I'm going to do my job well today. That's when God moves. That's when God works. I think people sometimes go through their whole life wondering, am I making an impact? Am I making a difference? And let me just tell you, if you're obeying God and doing what he's telling you to do, you are. You may not see the big picture. God does. God does. You have value. Be faithful. To him. Don't be discouraged. There, I bet there's somebody in here that feels pretty discouraged where you are right now in your either your walk with Christ or maybe where he's asked you to be. Or Don't be discouraged. God has you right where he wants you and he will use you. Just be faithful. Be faithful. Look at Numbers 4. Let's, let's look at the, the very towards the end real quick. I want to I want to really focus on this part because this is probably the thing that stood out to me the most of where I am in my life, and I hope it speaks to some of you too. Verses 46 and 47. All the numbered men of the Levites whom Moses and Aaron and the leaders of Israel numbered by their families and by their father's households from 30 years and upward even to 50 years old, everyone who could enter to do the work of service and the work of carrying in the tent of meeting. And it goes to, now, here's my, what would you consider... The, the actual prime of life, like what age is? 70. 70 plus, probably, yeah. You're not quite there, Tommy. I'm hoping next five, ten years maybe we'll get there. I think you'll probably get different responses based on who you ask, uh, um, on, on what the prime of life is. But some might say, you know what, it, it was a time of life where, where I didn't have as many worries. Some people might say, hey... Boy, I wish I could go back to 10 years old where mommy and daddy were uh, doing all the bills and I didn't have to worry, you know. And, and then, you know, so I, I think a lot of people, some say, you know what, I can't wait till that retirement age where I can just focus on, you know. Now, but to God, when they're numbering, he says, you know what, between 30 and 50, there's a special time in your life. Now, now, you're, let's go back. Numbers 1, there's a census. They numbered every male from what age and up? 20. Numbers 3, they're, they're numbering the Levites. And they numbered from what age and up? One month. And then we get to Numbers 4, and this gets confusing, but they start numbering between 30 and 50. And they start looking at over and over, seven times in this chapter, between 30 and 50, between 30 and 50. Now, what, what's the deal with this? Again, chat numbers one, they're numbering for the purpose of? 
battle, war. Number three, they're numbering for the purpose of service. And God says, if you're a month old, guess what? I can use you. But there's a prime of life. Because guess what? A one-month-old can't carry the ark. Okay? Nor would you want a one-month-old carrying the ark. So, so seven times in this chapter, it talks about this age range from 30 to 50. Now, I, I want to kind of think through that because this is something that kind of I was just thinking through. Why would God choose 30 to 50? And I came up, you probably come up with more, but there are four reasons that I was thinking that this is an important time of life. One is this. Between the ages of 30 and 50, we become mature. Do you remember all the dumb stuff you did before you are you know, 25, 30 years old, or especially teenagers. I told y'all, I went with, to Israel with a bunch of youth uh, a, a couple years ago in 2017, and those guys, especially the males, were just wired that way. They were doing some of the dumbest stuff. I mean, here we have this huge 2,000-foot drop, and they're over there, <laughs> you know, I'm like, dude, you understand this is like life and death, like not just kind of, it really is, you know, and, and they're doing all these things, one slip and you're gone, and I'm like, they are so immature, right? And I'm thinking, yeah, but I guess I probably was more like that when I was that age. But between 30 and 50, you kind of hit, or you should, hit your peak maturity, right? You should hit your peak maturity. Now, um, I, if I was putting people in charge of transporting holy objects, do you think maturity is an important thing? Yes. Can you imagine teenagers trying to... I'm telling you, how many people would have died touching the ark or touching some of these objects that God told them not to touch if it was teenagers? They'd be like, oh, I wonder what's in here. I see a little opening, right? Now, so maturity is important. So I think that's one reason why God says, I want the people transporting these things to be between, be between 30 and 50. Second thing, between these ages, that's when you are the strongest, Sometimes people are strong younger, but as you get older, the more physical labor you do, the more strength you have, right? The more strength you have. Now, I'm not what the world calls a strong man, okay? I'm just not, sorry. I, 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 you know, I was kind of thinking, Julie, this is as good as it's going to get, okay? I'm, I'm, that's, this, is, this is me, okay? I'm at my peak strength at this point. Um, but after 50, I also understand that sometimes strength begins to kind of go down a little bit. I hadn't made it there yet, which kind of scares me because I'm not all that strong to begin with. So, uh, but strength, is, you're at the peak of it, 30 to 50. The third thing is, between 30 and 50, typically you have some energy, right? I mean, by the time you get 50, I mean, every time I call Tommy, he's, he's sleeping. So, I mean, <laughs> you know, so, so, I mean, but <laughs> the Levites had a big job. They needed energy. Carrying all those things, packing all those things up, that was not an easy job. And, and so between 30 and 50, God says, that's when I want to use them. And then the last one I thought about is something even a little more kind of practical. It's between 30 and 50, typically they've already started to have kids. And you have downline watching everything you do. Like I mentioned earlier. Can you imagine if you're a Kohenite knowing that, that your day is coming, that you have to carry that ark, but you also know that if you touch it, you're dead? How much closer would you pay attention to your dad carrying the ark? So, so you, you know that between 30 and 50, a lot of times there's, there's generation watching every move you make. Now, I say that all to say God expected these Levites to work really hard for him. And he said, everybody 30 to 50, I want you to, to, to count them. But here's the scary part to me as I was unpacking this. I'm almost halfway through my prime of life. If 30 to 50 is the time where God says, you're going to have more energy to, to work for me. You're going to have more strength to work for me. You're going to be able to, to do all, and you're going to have kids watching. So it's really important to get it right. I'm almost halfway through my time. Of this prime of life and my question is do I realize the weight of that 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 there is a day coming where some of those things that God has put in me will start to diminish and I won't feel like doing them like I once was able to and, and it's even more important as I start getting to some of these texts about making the most numbering your days it says in Psalms or making the most of every second in Ephesians those things matter. 
I've got one shot at doing this the right way. So my question is, am I investing everything I have to my children? Am I doing this thing right? And here's the other thing. And that might, some of you may say, gosh, I've missed it. I'm, I'm, I'm already 95 like Tommy or something. I'm, I'm already past 50. <laughs> I don't even know how old you are, Tommy. Okay, yeah. Uh, and you may say, you know what? I've missed that window. Let me tell you. Do you know what happens when these people turn 50? They don't go home and put their feet up. Actually, far from that. Turn to Numbers 8. Turn to Numbers 8. Because God has very specific instructions for when they turn 50. Look at verse 25 and 26 with me. But at the age of 50 years, they shall retire from the service and the work and not work any more. They may, however, assist their brothers in the tent of meeting to keep an obligation, but they themselves shall do no work. Thus you shall deal with the Levites concerning their obligations. It's this idea, and if you go back to the original Hebrew, it says this, they shall be like a watchman and, in, and assist the other Levites. So at 50, you understand at 50, you have more experience then a 20-year-old, 30-year-old, 35-year-old, you have more time with God. You, have, you know what you're talking about. And God says, you have a different role when you get 50. You may not have the energy you used to have. You might not be able to carry the ark like you used to be able to. But you still have a role. And that role is you come alongside and you assist the younger ones, the ones that are currently doing it. So I'm telling some of you in here, where you may not be able to physically do everything that you could do in years past. God says there is no complete retirement where you go put your feet up spiritually. Because there's always younger generations that need your wisdom, that need the things God has put in you and invested in you, and they need you to come alongside them. And I don't know what that looks like for you, but here's the thing, part of our job as believers is to be looking for ways to invest the things God has put in us. And I'm telling you what, many, many, many times that's finding those younger than us that are making the same mistakes we used to make and pulling alongside them and saying, let me show you how to do it. And that's exactly what he, he did with these these guys, once they turn 50, they didn't just say, hey, I'm done with the temple service. I'm gone. See you later. I put in my time. Now just come bring me some food and drink. They didn't say that. They came alongside the younger ones and said, let me just show you how to do it. I want to be a watchman to make sure we get this right. Questions or thoughts on any of that? So our job this week, be in touch with God. When he's moving, it's time for you to pick up camp and move too. When he sits still, it's time for you to sit still. Listen to him. Be sensitive to the spirit. Don't worry if you don't have the spotlight on you. That's not what it's about. It's about God and his work. Just be faithful. God, I just thank you for this group. I thank you for how you continue to teach us through this Old Testament book of Numbers, God, of how you bring it to life and you show us how things uh, connect together because it is all one story. God, I pray that you would help us to be sensitive to you this week. God, use us, encourage everyone in this room that they matter, that you have them right where you want them and they have an important role in your kingdom. God, we have an enemy that wants to take our eyes off of that and wants to, us to get discouraged and wants us to throw pity parties, but God, you want to encourage us. Help us to see that the story is about you and not about us. Help us to be faithful in that story. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.